We're going to talk to you today about raising capital. Um, has anybody done that yet? Um, really, really important to be clear on your goals prior to raising capital. Um, I've dealt with a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, and let me just take a step back. I said I've been involved with companies. I, I sort of scanned over that. What I've been doing for the past 12 years is serving on boards as an independent board director, serving on advisory boards for now probably about 15 different companies, uh, one of which is a uh, venture firm. Uh, so I've sort of seen um, the process from both sides. And um, I've seen how it can go bad. Um, so, and not to be facetious, but I mean, I, I've seen entrepreneurs that range from those that are trying to conquer the world, that just want to be in control of everything, uh, that are using this as a mechanism to get a job, um, that are looking to jumpstart a business but don't want to run it. They want to hire a professional CEO. Um, uh, to those that want to build value and, uh, and sell the business and, and sort of monetize that value. Uh, those that want to uh, learn, uh, seek mentors that may have more experience than they do, um, and um, leverage that opportunity uh, to, to become a better entrepreneur. I think where um, I've seen people waste a lot of time in raising capital um, is by not being realistic on what the real long-term potential is for the business. I've also seen a lot of uh, substantial mistakes. So a company that I've served on the board for for some time, um, I won't mention the name because it's all proprietary information, but uh, they went organic. So they had a really good idea, uh, enterprise-focused security technology. Um, they had a really good idea. They funded their business through customers. So they built a product. They were basically eating Cheerios uh, three meals a day for a couple of years, uh, working out of a kitchen. Um, and um, they uh, got their first customer, um, kept the company really small, didn't hire a whole lot of people, kept on developing. It took them a lot longer to get to $2 million in revenue. Uh, than it would have if they went and raised capital. But by the time they raised capital, they already had 10 customers. Uh, they had uh, revenue. Uh, they had proof points. Um, so then they sort of went into reverse mode, where over the course of the next four years, they raised $50 million in capital. And the net result is they lost control over the business. Uh, and the investor that funded the last round basically had veto rights on, on any uh, offer to acquire the company under a certain amount. So they built tremendous value, but they can't unlock the value uh, because of that. So I'll, I'll fill you in on more details on things to watch out for, uh, but really important to be realistic about the long-term potential of the business, not just in terms of how you can build it, but who are the potential entrants from a competitive standpoint uh, that, um, that you might have to deal with? So uh, if you're fortunate enough to get a term sheet uh, from an investor or to get your uh, wealthy uncle uh, to uh, decide to invest in your business, be careful what you ask for. Um, and any time that you're raising capital, whether it's from friends and family or from other sources, you will lose some control. Uh, and what I mean by that is lose control in terms of how you grow the business, lose control over uh, your ability to make uh, decisions on material events, such as selling the business, uh, how you scale the business, how you, um, um, you know, what, what markets you go after. Uh, dilution, is everybody familiar with that concept? and how it works. Um, a lot of people are very, have, have you ever heard of the term up round versus down round? Yes, how many yes? No? 
Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll fill you in on that. But uh, dilution is something that will happen. Um, so, but you need just to be aware of what that could mean to you. Uh, you know, I, I'll give you an example of, uh, you know, two co-founders of a company. They founded the company. It was founder shares. They owned 100% of the company. Uh, by the time they got to their D round, that's four rounds of funding, uh, they, their combined uh, equity in the company is 10%. So pretty substantial dilution. But the value of the round, the first round, uh, the pre-money value was about $5 million. The post-money value on the last round was $165 million. So do the math, um, the value of their equity has increased. Uh, carrying costs, if you're uh, going after convertible debt or debt, you know, there's, a, there's an interest carry that's going to be accrued interest that you, you need to factor into your overall operating expense. And uh, last of all, really applies to debt uh, from institutions is there's pretty nasty covenants that, um, that you'll get even on so things like AR lines, accounts receivable lines, uh, or if you're taking a lot of companies that raise venture capital, uh, will go and seek venture debt um, against that collateral. So I'll explain more of what, what that's all about. So uh, I already mentioned this, but again, uh, a lot of this is you're not going to go out and talk to a growth stage venture capital firm tomorrow um, that is looking to invest you know, 20 to $30 million in a business. So there's steps that you go through, uh, but understanding what all those uh, sources of capital are, uh, I think will ultimately help you. So this is my favorite source of capital, customers. The best way to fund a business is through revenue. Uh, you don't lose control. You don't get diluted. Uh, you also get references while you're going along. Uh, customers can either fund your business through uh, buying your products or services. They can also fund your business uh, through investing in your business. Uh, and uh, so we call that strategic investors. Uh, strategic investors are also great investors because they, they tend to be very hands-off uh, from a control and operations standpoint. They tend not to take board seats. Uh, they, they will ask for observation rights which basically means you have to share all the information with them that you would share with a typical board with the exception that they have no uh, vote on any material decision. Um, a potentially easier but more complicated source of capital is friends and family, uh, which is probably uh, for those of you in the room that want to fund a business, <clears throat> that's going to be your go-to uh, starter because you probably don't have enough in terms of either experience uh, or a uh, product that's been created uh, to, uh, to go out to you know, uh, uh, organized investors. Um, but there's a lot of dangers uh, in seeking capital. Uh, it can make for very, very um, um, difficult holiday events. Uh, grants is a, a source that you know, certainly uh, I'm sure Dan and the, the folks here at Horn have talked about various mechanisms for raising capital through uh, state, federal, nonprofits that have grant programs. Um, if you can find the right match and if you have the stamina uh, to deal with the application process, uh, can be a very good source for you. Uh, banks, uh, 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 getting debt, uh, lines of credit is another source. Tough, unless you have collateral, I'll go through what, what these folks actually require. Uh, crowdfunding, uh, sort of popular um, thing that's going on. There's probably a, a dozen or so crowdfunding sites. Um, if you have an exciting idea, it may be a way to raise capital uh, with, let's say, minimal investment of time and effort. Uh, but you know, trying to get a sense of the actual dollars that you can raise is, is not always easy there. Uh, venture capital, where I've spent most of my career, both on the fundraising side, advising side, um, is uh, uh, fund-based, 
Uh, so there's, there's really multiple levels, but some people call them angel seed, um, some early stage uh, and growth, and then uh, private equity, uh, which tends to have a very different sort of look in terms of uh, size of uh, investment, size of funds. Uh, typical venture funds, angel seed funds, 25 to 50 million. Uh, early stage funds, around 100 million. Growth stage funds, 100 to 300 million. Uh, PE funds, um, upwards of a billion dollars. So, uh, types of funding. Uh, grants, uh, fixed amount, uh, deals, meaning customers, uh, which is my favorite source, um, which I really like because there's no carry, there's no dilution, there's no loss of control. Uh, debt must be collateralized. So you need to have revenue, you need to have customers, uh, you need to have an asset that can be monetized, uh, which could be real estate. Uh, or what have you, uh, with the exception of an SBA loan, uh, which, you know, for the right business could be um, a useful vehicle. Um, convertible debt, is anybody familiar with what convertible debt is? Basically like a note that has some sort of accrued interest associated with it that has an option to convert to equity, um, which is an instrument that um, you may use for friends and family. Uh, you may use for um, individual uh, investors that are, uh, as opposed to organized angel funds that just might be high net worth individuals that are looking to invest in a business. And the reason for that is um, it's very difficult to set valuation. Uh, so um, for very early stage companies, convertible debt could be a very good vehicle. So the idea being, um, for example, uh, you, you do a $50,000 note, uh, you take prime rate, you add two or 3% to it, you accrue interest on an annualized basis, and then you give that investor an option to convert to equity uh, based upon an institutional investment that may occur at some later point in time. So I've seen this work pretty well uh, for pre-revenue, pre-product companies. Uh, and then equity, uh, which um, I'll explain some dynamics of that uh, later in the discussion. So what are their goals? Uh, customers solve a business problem. Uh, and you know, if, if it's investing, uh, in your business as well as just buying your product, then it's, there's got to be some sort of strategic implication. Um, friends and family to help you out. Uh, grants, you know, promote business and jobs and goodwill. Uh, banks, um, it's really generated predictable return. Uh, crowdfunding, um, is an opportunity for non-qualified investors. So typically, if you take a look at um, angel funds or venture funds, um, the way that those funds get raised, typically the smaller funds are high net worth individuals, the larger funds are institutions, uh, which could be like a retirement fund, it could be a, a Wells Fargo, it could be a JPMC. Uh, where you know the limited partners are qualified investors that typically have a net worth of five million dollars or more. Um, typically, these funds are uh, focused on generating um, five plus x return. Typical fund life is ten years. Typical number of investments for a fund is going to be ten to twelve investments. Uh, again. While some of you might be in a position to go after uh, the angel seed uh, uh, investors, it, it is important to understand where that investment, if they're investing in you, sits in the life of their fund. Because you get strange behaviors out of, uh, uh, out of uh, the, the venture community based upon where they are in the fund. Um, uh, I actually... Um, one of the companies I sit on the board for just got acquired last week. 
Um, and you know, it, it's a company that probably could have gone a lot longer as an independent company. Uh, it's a great acquisition, it's a great return for the investors. Part of the reason they got acquired was we were at year 14 in a 10-year fund. And the uh, venture firm that owns 70% of the company uh, had no choice but to find a way to return uh, capital to their limiteds. So it's part of the covenant of their agreement with their limited partners. So very important. So you, you know, typically what you're going to see is you're going to see if you are a later investor in a fund, they're going to have more of a uh, tendency to want to exit. Uh, if you're uh, an early uh, investment in their fund, they're going to have a tendency to want to go long. So you could be in a situation as an entrepreneur where you know, you've raised some capital, uh, they have veto rights uh, because typically what happens is in those scenarios, um, seats don't vote, shares vote. So what I mean by that is if you have five people on a board, uh, it's not, uh, and it's typically a super majority as opposed to a simple majority, so you'd need to have four seats. It's typically how many shares they own, how much equity they have in the company that determines um, the decision which means that typically your venture investors uh, have a lot of weight in decisions. Uh, private equity, uh, very different uh, in that they're typically buying successful businesses that are not optimized, turning them around, and it's all about generating cash returns as opposed to uh, driving an exit. So we've seen a lot of these big PE deals where you know they're they're trying to take companies uh, uh, private. Um, I was actually uh, advising the CEO of BlackBerry uh, over the course of the past six months or so. Um, you know, one of their options uh, because they were getting crushed in the public market was to raise capital, try to take the company uh, private. They had a company by the name of Fairfax Holdings that was trying to pull that off, and they were unable. Uh, to, to uh, raise the capital uh, required to do that. So what are they looking for? Uh, customers, uh, they're going to evaluate, obviously, what alternatives they have, whether it's internal, whether it's uh, you know, competitive. They're looking for the best product at the best price. Uh, and as I had mentioned before, um, if your product or service is strategic to that business, um, then that's what could take just a customer relationship and turn it into an investment relationship. Um, friends and family, who knows what they're looking for, but um, you will be indebted to them for the rest of your life um, uh, once you take that capital. Uh, but ultimately, um, that indebtedness goes away uh, if you're returning their money and, and uh, um, generating a return on top of that, uh, which, by the way, um, in the friends and family situations that I've seen that have worked, I would try to find a way to pay back the principal first, but give them an opportunity to participate uh, in the overall success of the business. Um, banks, it really comes down to collateral. So probably, with the exception of SBA, uh, for most of your businesses, unless you have predictable revenue, um, probably not a good source to look, look at. Um, as I mentioned before, crowdfunding. Uh, the, the thing that's interesting is, if you take a look at sort of the population of people that are interested in investing in uh, new ideas, there's a very small portion of that population that's qualified investors. So there is actually an opportunity over time for crowdfunding to um, continue to grow and, and be a, um, a good source of capital. Um, the angel seed folks are typically pre-product, pre-revenue. The earlier you are, the more experience they're going to look for. So, you know, I also went to college. I also graduated, uh, went out in the job market looking for jobs. And we were just having this conversation. You know, the first question is, what experience do you have? Well, I went to college. 
what experience do you have doing this? Well, none. And so that's sort of the challenge that you get into with community is unless you're surrounding yourself with advisors, board members that have done this before, um, it's, it's going to be difficult uh, unless you're post-product. You've developed a product, you have a service, you have customers, they're going to rely less on your experience, uh, which you know, we've seen with companies like Google. These guys didn't have any experience, but they had a product that people were buying. And that's what caused um, the investment uh, to, to, uh, uh, to close. Um, early stage is typically post-product, uh, into the revenue phase, uh, a range of 250 to $2 million a year, uh, typically a handful of customers. Uh, you know, growth stage is five five million dollar uh, five million dollars in revenue plus. Uh, typically, most of these folks are looking for a fifty percent plus growth rate in the business. And then the whole world of private equity is it's broad, but uh, typical minimal investment is twenty to thirty million. Can be as much as a billion. Um, uh, typically focused on businesses that are in the you know thirty million dollar plus range uh, with a typically lesser growth rate. So I'll just sort of build this slide here so we can get into uh, questions. Um, you know, from everything I'm seeing on, you know, friends and family, it's 10 to 100K grants, typically in that range, but typically on the 10K side as opposed to the 100K side. Um, if you have a collateralized business, uh, you know, bank loans are typically in the 50 to 250 range. Crowdfunding, large range. Uh, I would say that these numbers on the venture side are, are fairly accurate. Um, I would say that when you start getting into early stage and growth companies, um, they uh, tend to want to do larger investments. And the main reason for that is if you can sort of do the math, if you have a $100 million fund and your target is 10 to 12 companies, that means that your allocation per company is going to be about 10 million. But typically, uh, what happens, happens with angels and seeds, they'll do one investment, and then they'll, they will not have pro rata uh, investment rights for follow on rounds. So as time goes on, what happens is they get diluted. So they're sort of, because they're limited in fund size, they'll go out and just do 100K investment here or there, and they'll have a portfolio of 50 investments. They tend to be less active in those companies, uh, and it's sort of like hedge bets. So if 10 of my 50 companies are successful, then I ultimately generate a return, whereas the early stage and growth stage investors tend to roll their sleeves up because they're limiting the number of companies they invest with. So what will happen is if I'm going to do a $3 million investment, I've got a 5 or $6 million allocation to that portfolio company for future rounds. Uh, and so this has sort of changed over the past five years or so where you'll see these funds are bigger and the initial investment size as a result is larger. And uh, I think I already mentioned sort of target investment size for P firms. So how do you set valuation? Does anybody know how valuations get set? Yeah, so the first, uh, so that's correct on all fronts. Um, the only typical, you'll get valuation set if it's a bank, and it's typically going to be just what's your business value, and there's, there's actually, I sit on uh, the advisory board for a company called Biz Equity, and they have this technology they've created called valuation as a service. So you can plug your numbers in, and it will give you sort of four different ways to do valuation, asset-based, income-based, et cetera. Uh, but when you get into the venture world, uh, valuation gets set based upon the segment that you're in and comparable investments. Um, so, um, and that's, that's typically why you have to sort of look at convertible debt as a vehicle uh, if you're not dealing with venture firms. Because it's, it's really, what I will say is this, that 
the entrepreneur never sets the valuation. The investor does. So um, there's some expectations that if you are considered to be a legitimate investment for you know, an angel, uh, that um, you'll tend to, uh, I think I have this in another slide, but um, yeah, uh, pre-revenue. Um, so pre-money investment, typically 500K to 5 million. Uh, early stage, so say you're sort of post-product pre-revenue, I tend to find that most of the pre-money valuations are about 5 million. So that means that if you're taking a million dollar investment, your pre-money is 5 million, your post-money is going to be 6 million, and then you can just do the math to figure out what equity, in this case, would be 20% that that investor would hold. Um, what I've seen in terms of uh, if it's revenue-based, I've seen huge ranges of you know, 1x your gross margin to 15x plus trailing revenues. I mean, crazy, crazy numbers. Um, you know, the company that uh, I sit on the board for that just uh, exited, uh, that deal was about 7x. It was about 7x uh, trailing revenues. Um, I've seen a couple deals just over the past you know, few months that are 20x trailing revenues. Um, well, actually, it's a company called Airwatch that was acquired by VMware. They're about 120 million in sales. They're acquired for 1.5 billion. Um, so now I can tell you that, that those sort of numbers didn't exist in 2008. They existed in 2000. Um, but you know, over the course of the past 12 years, it was very frothy based back in the late 90s, around 2000. Got really bad in the early 2000s. And then you know, in 2008, and now it's really sort of picked up. And a lot of that has to do, if you take a look at, just go out and like do a search on VentureBeat, um, and you can see some stats on the amount of investment that's taken place early stage, angel, growth, uh, the number of transactions, the actual investment size. Uh, it's pretty amazing over the, over the course of the past uh, couple of years. And if you take a look at the trending, it's, it's off the charts. And a lot of that has to do with there's less funds now than there was in 2008. Fund size, um, two, three times the size. And even though I said that most of the growth stage uh, equity funds are, uh, you know, 100 to 300 million, there are billion dollar growth equity funds. So, um, I gave you some color on pre and post. Uh, so that's sort of the, you know, if you're into that zone of um, acquiring capital from a, a, an angel or a seed investor, um, there's some other terms that you may have heard of, may not have heard of. Preferred stock is typically, so there's preferred and common stock. So everybody familiar with that term? Common stock is, and there's also something called founder share. So uh, when you start up a company, you have founder shares. Uh, you hire employees, you give them stock options for common shares. When you take investments from the outside, uh, what they buy are preferred shares, and there's typically a gap between the value of common shares and the value of preferred shares. Uh, so preferred share is basically what sets valuation in the company, even though uh, a share of common holds as much equity on a percentage basis as, a percent, as, as preferred. I know this is somewhat complicated, but it's probably most important to understand that preferred shares are at what we call the top of the stack. There are other things that investors will throw at you that uh, you need to be really careful about, such as participating preferred. Um, and I've seen everything from 1x to 2x to 3x participating preferred. So if I go back to my $5 million pre-money example, where uh, there's a million dollar investment, where the investor gets 20%, if that's 1x participating preferred, and I sell the company for 10 million, they will get 2x their investment off the top. So they'll get 2 million, 
and then they get 20% of the remaining $8 million. So they get $3.6 million on a, on a million dollar investment. So that's, so point is, avoid participating preferred. <laughs> uh, ratchets are something that you see less of now. Saw a lot of back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And that's almost like a tax. It's performance-based equity. So um, if you don't achieve certain results, then my equity increases. So it's sort of like something on top of participating. So point being, have your radar up. Avoid um, getting yourself into those situations. Um, and uh, you know, point here is that uh, investors are not bad, uh, but they have a different set of goals. Their goal is to return, um, have the greatest return for their limited partners. Because typically, most of these firms have two, three, four, five different funds. So, so their ability to raise the next fund is all about the return that they generated in their last fund. And you'll typically, even though the fund life is 10 years, you'll see if, if I do a really good job, my first fund, you know, I, I invest in, um, let's say out of the 10 companies I'm targeting, I have four investments after the first year and I get one exit, I'm already working on raising my next fund. Close my next fund uh, three years later, so I can have two or three or four funds running at the same time. That's how venture firms achieve huge success. So it's all about how much control they have, and it's all about the sort of returns that they generate that will um, um, determine their ability to raise new funds. Um, the other thing that I'd tell you, and again, this is something that can still show up with seed investors. Um, a lot of seed investors or uh, any fund-based investor, when you create a company, you're going to have founder shares. What a lot of folks will do is they'll say, well, founder shares are vested. So everybody understand the concept of vesting? So I'll just sort of build this slide here so we can get into uh, questions. Um, you know, from everything I'm seeing on, you know, friends and family, it's 10 to 100K grants, typically in that range, but typically on the 10K side as opposed to the 100K side. Um, if you have a collateralized business, uh, you know, bank loans are typically in the 50 to 250 range. Crowdfunding, large range. Uh, I would say that these numbers on the venture side are, are fairly accurate. Um, I would say that when you start getting into early stage and growth companies, um, they uh, tend to want to do larger investments. And the main reason for that is if you can sort of do the math, if you have a $100 million fund and your target is 10 to 12 companies, that means that your allocation per company is going to be about $10 million. So typically, uh, what happens, happens with angels and seeds, they'll do one investment, and then they'll, they will not have pro rata uh, investment rights for follow-on rounds. So as time goes on, what happens is they get diluted. So they're sort of, because they're limited in fund size, they'll go out and just do a 100K investment here or there, and they'll have a portfolio of 50 investments. They tend to be less active in those companies, uh, and it's sort of like, hedge bets. So if 10 of my 50 companies are successful, then I ultimately generate a return, whereas the early stage and growth stage investors tend to roll their sleeves up because they're limiting the number of companies they invest with. So what will happen is if I'm going to do a $3 million investment, I've got a 5 or $6 million allocation to that portfolio company for future rounds. Uh, and so this has sort of changed over the past five years or so where you'll see these funds are bigger and the initial investment size as a result is larger. And uh, I think I already mentioned sort of target investment side for P firms. So how do you set valuation? Does anybody know how valuations get set? Is it based on uh, revenue, like the, the viability of the business, 
whether or not they have customers. There's like a bunch of factors. In that. Yeah. So the first, uh, so that's correct on all fronts. Um, the only typical you'll get valuation set if it's a bank, and it's typically going to be just what's your business value. And there's there's actually I sit on uh, the advisory board for a company called Biz Equity, and they have this technology they've created called valuation as a service. So you can plug your numbers in and it will give you sort of four different ways to do valuation, asset-based, income-based, etc. Uh, but when you get into the venture world, uh, valuation gets set based upon the segment that you're in and comparable investments. Um, so, um, and that's that's typically why you have to sort of look at convertible debt as a vehicle uh, if you're not dealing with venture firms. Because it's, it's really, what I will say is this, that the entrepreneur never sets the valuation, the investor does. So um, there's some expectations that if you are considered to be a legitimate investment for you know an angel, uh, that um, you'll tend to, uh, I think I have this in another slide, but um, yeah, uh, pre-revenue. Um, so pre-money investment, typically 500K to 5 million. Uh, early stage, so say you're sort of post-product pre-revenue, I tend to find that most of the pre-money valuations are about 5 million. So that means that if you're taking a million dollar investment, your pre-money is five million, your post-money is going to be six million, and then you can just do the math to figure out what equity, in this case, would be 20% that that investor would hold. Um, what I've seen in terms of uh, if it's revenue-based, I've seen huge ranges of you know, 1x your gross margin to 15x plus trailing revenues. I mean, crazy, crazy numbers. Um, you know, the company that uh, I sit on the board for that just uh, exited, uh, that deal was about 7x. It was about 7x uh, trailing revenues. Um, I've seen a couple deals just over the past you know, few months that are 20x trailing revenues. Um, well, actually, it's a company called Airwatch that was acquired by VMware. There are about 120 million sales they're acquired for 1.5 billion. Um, so now I can tell you that, that those sort of numbers didn't exist in 2008. They existed in 2000. Um, but you know, over the course of the past 12 years, it was very frothy based back in the late 90s, around 2000. Got really bad in the early 2000s. And then you know, in 2008, and now it's really sort of picked up. And a lot of that has to do, if you take a look at, just go out and like do a search on VentureBeat, um, and you can see some stats on the amount of investment that's taken place early stage, angel, growth, uh, the number of transactions, the actual investment size. Uh, it's pretty amazing over the, over the course of the past uh, couple of years. And if you take a look at the trending, it's, it's off the charts. And a lot of that has to do with there's less funds now than there was in 2008. Fund size, um, two, three times the size. And even though I said that most of the growth stage uh, equity funds are, uh, you know, 100 to 300 million, there are billion dollar growth equity funds. So um, I gave you some color on pre and post. Uh, so that's sort of the, you know, if you're into that zone of um, acquiring capital from a, a, an angel or a seed investor, um, there's some other terms that you may have heard of, may not have heard of. Preferred stock is typically, so there's preferred and common stock. Is everybody familiar with that term? Common stock is, and there's also something called founder share. So uh, when you start up a company, you have founder shares. Uh, you hire employees, you give them stock options for common shares. When you take investments from the outside, uh, what they buy are preferred shares, and there's typically a gap between the value of common shares and the value of preferred shares. 
Uh, so preferred share is basically what sets valuation in the company, even though uh, a share of common holds as much equity on a percentage basis as, a percent, as, as preferred. I know this is somewhat complicated, but it's probably most important to understand that preferred shares are at what we call the top of the stack. There are other things that investors will throw at you that uh, you need to be really careful about, such as participating preferred. Um, and I've seen everything from 1x to 2x to 3x participating preferred. So if I go back to my $5 million pre-money example, where uh, there's a million dollar investment, where the investor gets 20%, if that's 1x participating preferred, and I sell the company for 10 million, they will get 2x their investment off the top. So they'll get 2 million, and then they get 20% of the remaining 8 million. So they'll get 3.6 million on a, on a million dollar investment. So that's, so point is, avoid participating preferred. Uh, ratchets are something that you see less of now. Saw a lot of back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And that's almost like a tax. It's performance-based equity. So um, if you don't achieve certain results, then my equity increases. So it's sort of like something on top of participating. So point being, have your radar up. Avoid um, getting yourself into those situations. Um, and uh, you know, point here is that uh, investors are not bad, uh, but they have a different set of goals. Their goal is to return, um, have the greatest return for their limited partners. Because typically, most of these firms have two, three, four, five different funds. So, so their ability to raise the next fund is all about the return that they generated in their last fund. And you'll typically, even though the fund life is 10 years, You'll see, if, if I do a really good job, my first fund, you know, I, I invest in, um, let's say out of the 10 companies I'm targeting, I have four investments after the first year and I get one exit, I'm already working on raising my next fund. Close my next fund uh, three years later so I can have two or three or four funds running at the same time. That's how venture firms achieve huge success. So. It's all about how much control they have, and it's all about the sort of returns that they generate that will um, um, determine their ability to raise new funds. Um, the other thing that I'd tell you, and again, this is something that can still show up with seed investors. Um, a lot of seed investors or uh, any fund-based investor, when you create a company, you're gonna have founder shares. What a lot of folks will do is they'll say, well, founder shares are vested. So everybody understand the concept of vesting? Um, you know, if I'm an employee, I join a company, I'm going to get a stock option grant, and I'm going to vest those shares over the course of four years. So, and there's typically, uh, I have to stay on board for six months to vest any shares, and then it, my shares vest ratably every month for the following um, balance of that uh, vesting period. Founder shares is something that I own out of the gates because it's my company. What a lot of investors will do is they'll say, well, um, because founder shares sit above preferred, they take founder shares and they say, we'll reissue common stock options and we'll accelerate vest. You know, so let's say that you've had your business for one year They'll say, well, we'll accelerate vest 25% of them. Um, typically, something you can't avoid. Just be aware, just be aware of it, though. Um, so you can do the math on dilution. I'll just go back to my five million, one million, uh, five million pre-money valuation, million dollar investment scenario. Uh, if you had 100% of five million. Um, and now the valuation is six million, you only own five million, you can do the math on what your uh, resulting equity is. 
Uh, so in that case, it's a 20% dilution. Um, so the preference stack is typically going to work like this. Um, you know, if you're in a further evolved business, uh, you're going to have debt, which may be AR lines. You're going to have venture debt. Then you're going to have investors like preferred stock. And then you're going to have everything below that. Uh, what always sits at the top of the stack is going to be um, the uh, AR line first, venture debt second, preferred shares third, and then everything else below that. Um, so it's just important to understand how things get paid out when you, when you sell your business. So what's the process, timing, level of effort? Um, you know, for customers, it's proving out your product or service. Uh, you know, and obviously, you know, if, you're, if it's consumer-based, um, it's, it's really how many do you have, which is going to sort of drive uh, your success. Um, I can't give you an answer on friends and family. It's, uh, it's really a matter of the relationship and the willingness to help. Um, formal business plans for grant-based work typically the process of filling out grant documents and dealing with their whole process of diligence is pretty daunting. Uh, in some cases, it could be more daunting than you know, going after seed or angel capital. Uh, you know, banks, is, it's, you're going to have to have collateral and financials. Um, and venture, um, the process is typically, if you have an investable business, um, from start to finish, meaning start when you start going out and pounding the pavement, finish to the point where you get a wire. Um, best case I've ever seen is 90 days. Worst case is two years. Uh, so it can take a while. Um, but typically it's business plan, it's customers, it's all of your, you know, uh, whether you're an LLC, whether you're an S Corp, uh, having all of your documents in order. Really important to get that organized uh, out of the gates. Um, so you have it you know, in electronic form and you can put it in what people call a data room uh, for the purposes of doing diligence. Typical time from term sheet, which is a non-binding document that says, yes, we want to invest subject to doing diligence to investing um, is 30 to 60 days. Uh, so the more you have yourself organized for diligence, the faster that process goes. Um, you know, including things like your, what's your pipeline, uh, bios, references. References are a really big piece, uh, and the references are twofold. One is customer references. And if they're not customers or in your pre-product, it's customers that will buy once you have a product. Uh, but it's also personal references for everybody involved in the business. Uh, really, really important. And you know, you typically want to have three or four uh, personal references. So I think I sort of covered some of this. Uh, what's, what I love about customers is they collaborate, but they don't have control. Uh, crowdfunding, they're uninvolved. Um, when you get into the venture world, they tend to be very involved. And when you get into the P uh, world, they're so involved that you probably don't have a job anymore uh, because they tend to replace their management teams. Um, so, you know, I. I think earlier in the presentation I said be careful what you ask for. If this is okay with you, um, losing control to generate a return and to learn, um, then this is a, an avenue worth pursuing. If you want to have control in your business, um, eat Cheerios and go organic. Um, I guess the only thing I'd say, and you know, this is, you know, I'm, I'm talking to, uh, I think, a group of people that some have a business, others have ideas, 
Others want to have an idea and a business. Um, I've had the same conversation with 40 year olds that have been in the business for 20 years uh, that still don't get this part right, which is sweet spotting what we're trying to accomplish here. What's my stage? Matching that up with the right investment vehicle. What do I really want out of this? Um, what do I think I really need? And typically when you're raising capital, you want to have it match up uh, with your business plan uh, so that you have 18 months of runway. You may not be able to achieve that, but as you go to the more institutional source of capital, they won't invest in you unless you have a good path to get 18 months of runway because the amount of time it takes to raise capital, who's actually tried to raise capital? You have a business, but you haven't, you haven't sought capital yet? Um, it takes time. And you know, if you're the person that's creating the product or service, you're the person that's also selling that product or service, while you're out raising capital, you're unable to build that product or sell that product. Um, and this is a trap that a lot of entrepreneurs and CEOs fall into is they, their, their time gets cut in half, if not worse, uh, and it, unless they have help around them, uh, it makes it very complicated to keep the business uh, going while you're doing that. Um, understand their investment criteria. Probably for this group, the most important thing that you can do is whatever product area, industry, target audience you're going after, uh, try to surround yourself with trusted advisors uh, that have experience in that space, uh, that can help you with introductions, uh, that can help you vet your product, vet your, um, your presentation, vet your idea. Um, because that ultimately may be your mechanism to get the sort of credibility you need uh, to get uh, funded. Um, find customers that even if you don't have a product will say, yep, if this product existed, I'd use it. Um, create a target list. Do some research. Uh, use LinkedIn. It's a, a great vehicle. I mean, the world is so much easier now with LinkedIn. And it's easier now with LinkedIn than it was three years ago with LinkedIn. So you start looking around at um, you know, who in this particular segment that I'm targeting with my business went to the University of Delaware? Uh, good starter. Um, uh, who is involved in a local business that I'm familiar with that may be able to help me? Uh, so uh, I would uh, invest considerable amount of time in those two areas. Uh, while you're spending time investing in trying to figure out what your business is uh, and what your business plan is. Uh, there's a lot of industry events. There's a lot of things that the Horn Program is getting more and more involved in. Uh, there's industry events here uh, in the DC metro area and the Philly area uh, that are uh, entrepreneurial events and I, I would uh, sort of make a list and try to figure out what you can cover. So uh, that's a lot. Um, I didn't tell you everything, but I, I sort of wanted to give you a picture of the complete picture. So how many people still want to have a business where you see capital? I, I will tell you this, that I think that um, if you remember 60% of what I just told you, you probably know a lot more about the world of raising capital than um, a lot of entrepreneurs that have successful businesses. Believe me, there's a lot of successful businesses that don't understand half of what I just told you. Um, so the more you know, uh, the better it's going to help you navigate. So uh, any questions? Yes? Do you think uh, because of our like increased dependency on technology and the fact that uh, I'd say probably every business has um, an adaptable website or web application nowadays. Um, 
that crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter would seem like kind of take over the traditional ways of raising capital? Because I've seen ideas on Kickstarter that raise 250k and they still have 30 days left. Um, I mean, they're great ideas, but I, I think it fills a niche. But you, you think about who the investors are in crowdfunding. You know, they're individual, typically, maybe some of them are qualified investors, maybe some of them weren't. And so those people may be putting $500, $1,000, $2,000 into that investment, um, seeing, you know, a $250 million fund. Um, so, you know, in those cases, the limiteds are, uh, well, I'm going to JPMC, and JPMC is pulling uh, $25 million from high net worth individuals. So high net worth individuals, you know, those that have net worth of $20, $50 million plus. Uh, so I think it fills a niche. I think where it, it may creep into the angel seed round, so what that may mean for angels and seed investors is their fund size needs to get larger and their initial investment needs to get larger. But I think it, it creates an opportunity. Um, but, you know, the, the, thing, that's, the thing that is uh, risky with crowdfunding is if you have a, an idea that's undeveloped, that's a really great idea, um, you know, you could, uh, that, that idea could be stolen. And you know, there's no way to really protect your IP uh, when you go to crowdfunding. The reality is that there's no way to protect your IP when you go to an angel investor or a seed investor or a venture firm. Uh, and I can tell you that some of these folks are sharks. So make sure when you go to an angel fund, look at their portfolio companies in advance, make sure that none of their portfolio companies creep into the space that you're targeting. But I, I think for earlier stage businesses, yes, crowdfunding uh, could be interesting. Be really careful though. Uh, you know, the, the uniqueness of your idea, it's just an idea. So what are your, I, mean, I think there's something that's important to know when you think about all this, which is what are the barriers to competitive entry? Well, if it's just an idea, and it's a great idea, there's really no barrier to competitive entry, especially if the competitor has capital and has resources and you don't. Uh, if it's an invention with a patent um, or something that's really difficult to create that requires expertise, then you start getting a, a decent barrier to entry. Uh, if you have a ton of customers already, that's another barrier to entry. Uh, typically, early stage companies don't have all those things. It's either a great idea uh, that has some IP protection. Uh, and patent laws, Dan, have you talked about patents and first to file and all that stuff? We've had a few things, but not, I'm guessing most of this group Yeah, I mean, it's just, I, I think barrier to entry is a really key thing. Uh, and, you know, the more unique the IP, uh, the more investable it is. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that the world is moving uh, to benefit the earlier stage company by first to file uh, having uh, more protection uh, than in the past. In the past, it was the first one to get the patent granted. Uh, so you can file, you know, as long as you connect yourself with the right resources, of which I believe there are some through the Horn program, and you have something that's patentable, um, you know, I'd, I'd really consider uh, pursuing that in advance of, you know, letting the world know about your idea. Yes? Is there any tips for using LinkedIn to search for advisors? Um, yeah, I mean, I think people are getting smarter about how to use LinkedIn. So, um, I don't know, I, I think I have like 1,500 contacts, uh, but I, don't, I only allow my contacts to see uh, my network. 
Uh, so there's different people do set themselves up in different ways, <clears throat> but um, you know I think the key is you, you just the more people you're linked in with, the easier it's going to be to get intros. Um, there are a lot of uh, folks that go anonymous on LinkedIn, but I mean, do searches, join groups, um, and you know, I think the the whole idea here is that this program is trying to get more alumni connected, and um, you know, this is a way that you can use alumni, especially if they're in a um, in a business or in a space that's uh, you know in the same domain that you're you're targeting. Uh, but, uh, you know, I always get requests for intros and sometimes make them. Other questions? Great. Thanks for your time.